Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, dear friends, well, we made it. And it is my utmost pleasure to welcome you all here in Istanbul and to welcome you to World Energy Congress 2016 edition, the world's largest gathering of the energy community. Let me start by thanking those of you who have participated in the Executive Assembly and the internal council events that preceded. More than anything, it is the Executive Assembly that defines the council as an active community of energy leaders and practitioners run by its members in an open and transparent fashion with the aim of promoting an affordable, stable, environmentally sensitive energy system for the greatest benefit of mankind. The Council has managed to stand out as a true rainbow bringing all these interests under one umbrella, supporting all but, prom but promoting none. And indeed, we include more universities, research organizations, and above all, individuals and energy consumers, be they businesses, communities, or families, to whom many of us owe our employment one way or another, and to whom we are all committed. Over the years, through its collaborative work program, its publications, and its numerous meetings, the Council has established itself as a leading, if not the top, body representing the energy sector, producers and users alike. None of this would be possible without our unique governance model that allows each member committee an active voice in the work of the Council. And of course, we continue to rely on the expertise of our member committees for the bulk of our work. Tonight, I would like to offer you all sincere th thanks for your commitment and hard work over the last year. To the Portuguese and Italian member committees in particular, I'd like to say a word of congratulations and thank you for offering to host the Lisbon 2017 and Milano 2018 Executive Assemblies. As our Turkish hosts will be able to confirm, the Assembly and its many side events is in itself a major undertaking and, as I pointed out, the event that makes the Council what it is a global family of energy enthusiasts. Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow morning we will join over 200 global energy and political leaders as well as several thousand delegates for four days of intensive dialogue on the current state and future direction of the energy sector. Never before have we met at a time of such profound change in our sector. Trends that were just beginning to emerge when we last met in Daegu, South Korea, three years ago, have morphed into what we now describe as the grand energy transition. Some of the biggest uncertainties of the last decades have now turned on their head. And let me start with the certainty of never-ending energy demand growth. In Daegu, one of the Council's main messages was that, was that peak oil was a myth and that there was plenty of oil and other hydrocarbon resources to provide rising demand for energy for growing populations. Today, 
we realize not only that there are plenty of hydrocarbons, but that supply is exceeding demand and by far. The fact is that per capita demand for energy, once on an ever rising trajectory, will finally peak sometime between 2020 and 2025. Energy intensity reductions supported by primary uh, energy substitution effects are set to increase at a faster rate than the demand increase from the growing global middle class. This shifts the discussion from peak oil to peak demand with anticipated growth limited to only a 20% increase over the next 45 years. This will have significant implications, not only for energy companies in terms of their ability to achieve their growth expectations, but also resource holders who can expect increasing competition for market shares. Indeed, fossil fuels that have been the cornerstone of the energy sector, representing roughly 80% of primary energy supply, will see their share reduced to anywhere between 10 to 30% by 2060. As we all know, the continued recovery of new resources and the emerging an emergence of new technologies that both enable the release of unconventional oil and gas and improve the recovery rates from existing fields have already multiplied the available fossil fuel reserves by a factor of four. Yet, the trajectory towards a lower share in the global energy mix remains unchanged. While fossil fuels will continue to have a significant role in the energy mix, contributing between half and two-thirds of our energy needs in 2060, coal could potentially only represent 5% in the overall mix. Oil will still be needed for transportation, providing over 60% of energy needs but overall demand will flatten out. And what about gas? Well, the golden age of gas will continue, although at a steady rate rather than witnessing exponential growth. With stagnating growth potential in the oil sector, and with coal likely to be of little importance by 2060, there will be a shift in the discussion from stranded private sector-owned assets to stranded public sector-owned resources in oil and particularly coal. This has the potential to cause significant stress to the current global economic and geopolitical equilibrium. Carefully weighted exit strategies spanning several decades need to come on top of the political agenda if we want <clears throat> sorry, to avoid the destruction of vast amounts of public and private shareholder value. Meanwhile, solar and wind power will continue their rapid growth with the electrification of energy use at an unstoppable trend. As a percentage of total final production, electricity could reach penetration levels by 2060 as high as 30%, with up to 98% coming from CO2, non-CO2 emitting technologies, a three-fold increase over the current share. Up to 40% of this electricity could come from wind, solar, and geothermal generation, a tenfold increase over current share. Already, 
annual global investment in renewables has overtaken investment in conventional generation capacity. However, one certainty remains, and that relates to the need to continue decarbonizing our economies. This will take considerable effort, and phenomenon such as the rise in renewables will not be enough. As governments respond to the challenge of delivering commitments made under the nationally determined contributions agreed last December in Paris, we can expect to see the energy sector to be further impacted in ways that are difficult to foresee. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the grand energy transition will put intense pressure on all countries to balance the energy trilemma by improving energy security, widening energy equity, and reducing their carbon emissions. For this to happen, the world needs to strive for continued innovation while maintaining stable investment net, uh, frameworks. Novel approaches will be needed to keep the trilemma balanced and avoid an even greater disruption. Furthermore, our ability to build and attract new skills will be critical to cope with these new realities. The challenge ahead is immense. We need enabling policies and trade frameworks to deliver integrated, effective, and efficient infrastructures, urban planning solutions, and adequate resilience responses. Governments, business leaders, investors, and society at large have to rethink the energy contract and find new ways to avoid deadlocks and allow for timely decisions. <clears throat> no, solutions will not solely come from within energy. But we've seen this over the years. Energy has a historic opportunity to provide leadership. Let me conclude by saying that the ground energy transition is an unstoppable phenomenon requiring worldwide political and economic collaboration at a scale beyond any previously witnessed in recent history. Adapting to these new realities with innovative technologies and different business models will require massive effort and our ability to respond rapidly will define both winners and losers. World Energy Congress, attended by ministers of both producing and consuming countries, corporate CEOs and consumer representatives, is one place where these collaborative discussions will take place. And finally, a special word of thanks to my dear friend, Hassan Murat Merchant, an esteem at the Congress Organizing Committee. Getting here has been a long and an uncertain journey, and I, I know that you have all worked incredibly hard. Thank you for your welcome and the Turkish hospitality for which, which you are so justly famed. So, on this note, I will conclude. I will invite you to enjoy the rest of the evening, and I look forward to seeing all, you all tomorrow and in the coming days. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.